Okay, uh, good evening everyone. So uh, let's start our uh, lecture of this week. Uh, last week uh, we discussed uh, conditional probability. So maybe uh, let's first have a very, very brief review of uh, conditional probability. The idea of uh, <coughs> The idea would be like this. So suppose that um, so you are interested in the probability that uh, an event A occurs. But before you know the outcome, uh, you know that B has occurred, right? Then uh, actually because B occurred, the outcome must be within B. So which means that uh, before you know this piece of information, uh, the outcome could be in Anyone could be anyone uh, within the sample space. And now the sample space has shrinked into B, right? And uh, because of this uh, extra piece of information, uh, in general, the probability that the outcome also in A will be changed, right? So that's the idea of uh, conditional uh, probability. So uh, before you know B occurs, um, the probability is called unconditional probability of A. After that, after you know B occurs, then uh, it has become the conditional probability of A given B, right? So then uh, the definition of uh, this conditional probability is, uh, is like this. Uh, it's just the probability of uh, A respect to B over probability of B. Why is defined like this? Because uh, now you know that the outcome must be within B. So if it is also in A, it must be in the intersection of A and B, right? And then uh, the probability should be understood as the, the area of the intersection over the area of B. So that's a, a very intuitive uh, explanation. So. Uh, <coughs> And actually, uh, last lecture, uh, we discussed a lot about this conditional probability. And uh, using the definition of a conditional probability, we also uh, introduced introduce several results. So for example, uh, multiplication rule, uh, law of total probabilities, and uh, the Bayes formula, right? But I think uh, the most important thing uh, was uh, the tree diagram. So because as long as you understand the tree diagram, and you will see all these results can be derived from tree diagram, right? Uh, what is the tree diagram? It is just something like this. The idea of tree uh, diagram uh, would be very straightforward. So just uh, discuss everything case by case. We just list all possible cases and discuss uh, if this case happens, what will be the probability? If that case happens, what will be the probability, right? So maybe uh, let me briefly review this. So all tree diagram will begin with, uh, so this root node. So this root node stands for the sample space, right? And then, so if we, uh, interested in uh, two events, A and B. So first, from this uh, root node, we can draw two branches. The first branch uh, stands for the event that B occurs. And the other one stands for the event that B complement occurs, where B does not occur, right? So then you see that with those two branches, there are two cases. And uh, then uh, we produce two more nodes. And this, at this node, we know that uh, B already occurred. And then from this node, we can consider whether A occurs or not, right? So then, uh, so this further node, uh, this further branch means A also occurs. But because uh, it's from this node, which means that B already occurred, then the probability that a occurs given that B has occurred would be a conditional probability, right? So then we will have uh, so this node, the node at the uh, next level. And uh, at this node, actually, so it stands for uh, both A and B uh, have a 
one third, right? So then, so the probability would be the uh, probability of their intersection. How can we derive this intersection if it's just the probability of a B times this conditional probability? Then we get this uh, this case. And because uh, there are uh, two events involved, and actually, so if we discuss in this way, uh, we will have four different cases. So this is A intersect B, this is a, a complement intersect B, and, and so on, right? So that's the uh, idea of uh, treat our graph. If, if you need to consider uh, two events, then eventually uh, you will need to consider four different cases, and we can list all the probabilities of those uh, four cases and so on. So uh, this is very uh, straightforward. And let's uh, be a formula and so on, okay. And then uh, at the end of uh, the last lecture, we discussed the uh, you know, conception of independence. So what does this mean? So we consider two events, A and B, and uh, we know that Generally speaking, uh, the information that B has occurred would change the probability that B occurs, right? Because uh, the unconditional probability will change into a conditional probability. But in certain cases, it is possible that even after you know B has occurred, uh, the probability that A occurs will not change. So in other words, it is possible that you know some information, but this information will not help you to know more about A, right? So in other words, so this uh, information, B occurs, has nothing to do with A. Those two events has nothing to do with each other, right? So based on this idea, uh, we introduce the conception of uh, the definition of uh, independence between two events, A and B. So what is the definition? It's a pretty straightforward if the conditional probability of A given B is equal to the unconditional probability of A, then we say A and B are independent events, right? So it's, uh, I think intuitively it's very easy to understand. And the last week we also uh, discussed that, so this definition is equivalent to the following proposition. If uh, A and B are independent, then the probability of their intersection must be equal to the product of their respective probabilities. So, so this definition is equivalent to this. Uh, it's equivalent to this uh, uh, proposition. So, and uh, because they're equivalent, so you can, you can also use that proposition as a definition. So it would be the same thing. And, uh, uh, and last time, I also said that actually, so those two definitions, uh, they have uh, different merits. So for example, the first one, I prefer to use the first one as a definition because uh, uh, it's very easy to understand. It means that you know B, but this will not help you to know more about A. So they're independent, right? But sometimes uh, people would prefer to use this, use the second one as a definition, because uh, it, looks, it looks better. So in the sense that the position of A and B are symmetric, right? So from this, you can see if A and B are independent, B and A must also be independent. How do I understand this? So for example, if we treat the first one as a definition, so then you may ask me a question like this. So if A and B are independent, we know that by this definition, it means that knowing B will not help you to know more about A, right? It will change the probability. Then if those two guys are independent, but this time, if we know that A has occurred, will this change the probability of B, right? By this definition, by the first definition, actually, it's, a, it's not straightforward. You cannot see this clearly, right? But if you use the second one as a definition, 
then it is uh, symmetric, then you will clearly see that if you know B, A has occurred, it will not change the probability of B either, right? So, which means that independence of uh, two events must be symmetric. So that's the merit of the of this definition. And I think uh, uh, most of the time we will use this property or use this as a, uh, as the property uh, for checking independence between two events. So then uh, maybe I can give you another example of uh, uh, independence. So this time, suppose that we consider uh, an ordinary deck of uh, uh, 52 playing cards, right? And uh, we select a card randomly from this deck. So 52 uh, playing cards means uh, each card could belong to uh, four different suits. Right, it could be uh, it could be a uh, uh, cards, uh, spades, clubs, and uh, uh, what spades, clubs, and, and diamonds, right? And then also, we know that uh, a card may belong to thirteen different ranks. It could be one, two, up to ten, or a jack, queen, or a king, right? So. So uh, one typically means ace, right? So then uh, for such a deck of uh, playing cards, then if uh, we use A for the event that the card is an ace, and H uh, means it is a heart, then uh, let's check whether A and H are independent. Right, how to do that, we just need to check whether the probability of the intersection is equal to the product of their respective probabilities, right? Uh, the probability of the intersection, it means the uh, probability of A intersect H. A means A's, H means R's. So the intersection means, so this uh, card is the ace of R's, right? We have totally 52 cards, and uh, among those 50, uh, 52 cards, there's only one card uh, that is ace of hearts, right? If we randomly select one, the chance will be one over 52. So that's the probability. And uh, what is the probability of uh, A, probability of ace? We know that we have four aces over 52, which would be one over 13, right? The probability of uh, hearts, we have 13 hearts. 13 over 52 would be one quarter. So the probability of H would be one quarter. Then let's check. Uh, so because uh, the probability of intersection is exactly equal to the product, uh, the probability of uh, uh, the, the product of those two numbers. So you see that A's and the parts should be independent. So that's the case, right? So this is a uh, very straightforward. This is a very straightforward example, but, and it, it is also very simple. But maybe uh, we can think a bit more why, in this case, A and H must be independent, right? And actually, uh, we can think of it because uh, this, this deck is just an ordinary deck uh, of 52 cards. And uh, as I said, so there are four suits, right? And each suit has exactly 13 cards. All suits uh, are, equal, are, the, are equal, right? The same. All of them have 13 cards each. So which means that whether you know it's, it's hearts, spades, clubs, or diamonds, it doesn't matter. The chance, you know the, this piece of information, the chance of ace will still be 1 over 13, right? So that's that's why in this example, A and H must be independent. Because uh, so because all the suits are just the same. All of them have 13 parts, right? If we change the slightly of the problem a little bit, suppose that so there's a 
one of cards missing. So now we have only, say, 51 cards. And if you go back to check this uh, problem, you will see it will no longer be independent. Why? Because uh, if there's a uh, one card missing, uh, one card missing, if the selected card is a, is a heart, then you will see that the chance of ace would be either 1 over 12, which means that the missing card is not ace, or 0, which means that the missing card is ace, right? So in either way, you know that it's a hard, and so the probability will, not, will no longer be 1 over 13. And you check that, so in this case, it will no longer be, uh, those two events will no longer be uh, independent, right? So I think uh, uh, probably I would just leave this as an exercise in the upper class. You can think a bit more of this example. And uh, there will be another way. So for example, uh, so this time, we may include two jokers. Now the deck becomes uh, 54 cards, 52 plus two jokers. So then, in this case, if a still means ace, h still means hearts. So you can check that whether so a and h are independent. And actually, the answer is no. If you have 54 cards, cards, then a and h will no longer be independent because uh, so the symmetric structure of, sweet, uh, of suits and ranks will be changed by those two tokens, right? So this is an example, and uh, you can consider, uh, exercise, consider some exercise uh, related to this. And uh, uh, so next, I will introduce another uh, result. So. Suppose that we have two independent events, A and B. So uh, for them, so let's think of the problem like this. Should A and B complement be independent? And this proposition says uh, A and B complement should also be independent. How do you understand this? So actually, this is very intuitive. A and B are independent means that you know that B has occurred. So this will not change the probability that A occurs, right? But suppose this time you don't, the, the information is uh, in the opposite way. So this time you know that B has not occurred. Will this change the probability of A, right? And actually, so intuitively, B occurs or B does not occur should contain the same type of information, right? So intuitively, they should be independent. So the thing is, uh, how to prove this? So is there any way to prove such a result? And actually, we just need to uh, follow, the, follow the, the proposition, so to check whether the intersection of two events, the probability of intersection of two events is equal to the product of their respective probabilities, then we can, we can, we can prove this. So maybe uh, let me briefly go over the, the proof. So here, again, uh, we know that A and B are independent, and we wish to show A and uh, B complement uh, are also independent. So how to do that? So essentially, we need to show the probability of the A inter 
first act of B complement is equal to probability of A times probability of B complement, right? As long as you can do this, then the independence uh, is proved. So how can we do that? And actually, maybe we can consider the, a Venn diagram to, to better understand the proof. So uh, this rectangle stands for uh, a sample space as usual. And uh, suppose the event B is on the right-hand side, so that is, which is that part. Uh, then the, 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 the right-hand side would be B complement, right? And this, uh, this circle is, uh, is event A. So if uh, uh, the Venn diagram looks like this, then let's consider so this uh, uh, yellow region. So this yellow region is uh, just uh, the intersection of A and B, right? This is on the right hand side and belongs to A. So it is this uh, intersection of A and B. And this uh, uh, purple region would be the intersection of A and B complement, so which is that part, right? Then we wish to know the probability of uh, this uh, purple region. And this uh, purple region, actually, from this uh, picture, you can clearly see that it is just a uh, uh, Event A removed the removed uh, the, the 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 yellow region, right? So this yellow region is A intersected B, and the blue region uh, and this purple region and the yellow region are actually disjoint, right? So then, how can we get this uh, uh, purple region? So it is just the A removes the yellow region. Why bother to consider this? Because uh, we know A and B are independent. So the probability of that yellow region should be equal to the product of uh, uh, probability of A and probability of B, right? So in this way, you can see that because uh, those two regions are disjoint and the union of them is exactly equal to A, so the probability of this uh, purple region should be equal to the probability of A minus the probability of the yellow region, right? The yellow region, what is this yellow region? Yellow region is just the probability of A times probability of B. So we have this. And then uh, it is a, there is a, a common coefficient, which is a probability of A. It can be taken out. And then so we have this. It is equal to the probability of A times 1 minus probability of B. So what is the probability of B? 1 minus probability of B it is the probability of uh, B complement, right? So you see from this, uh, so here, now we reach uh, that part. On the right-hand side, it is equal to the probability of A times probability of B complement, so which is equal to the probability of the intersection. So now we prove the independence. So this is a, a pretty straightforward uh, proof, and uh, it's not difficult. And uh, the detail of the proof is up here. Uh, actually, so uh, I think they make to mimic this proof, we can also uh, prove uh, the following question. So if A and B are independent, uh, should A complement and B complement be independent? Right? So of course, the answer should be yes. As long as uh, they're independent, their respective complements should also be independent. But I will leave this as an exercise uh, problem. So if you have time, to please try to finish this. So then uh, next we will discuss independence uh, among more than two events. So for example, we have three events A, B, C. Now how to define independence uh, among them? The definition is like this. Uh, three events are said to be independent if they satisfy four conditions, right? So 
because things are a bit more complicated. So what, what are they? So maybe let's first uh, skip the, the first condition. Let's, let's, let's first check the, the remaining three conditions. The first condition, uh, the, the, the second condition says that probability of A inter intersect B is equal to probability of A times probability of B. So we know that. What does it mean? It means that A and B should be independent, right? And for the, the same reason, if we check the third condition, we see that it means that B and C should be independent. And the fourth one means A and C should be independent, right? So for the, the, the last the three conditions, so these three conditions means that among three events, A, B, C, if we take any two of them, they must be independent, right? Among three guys, if we take any two of them, those two guys should be independent. That's the meaning of uh, condition, conditions two to four. Then, what is the, let's, uh, let's, let's see the, the first condition. What does it mean? To understand this, actually, uh, maybe I need to show you some, some notes so that we can have a better understanding. So now let's discuss the, the first condition. So probability of intersection of ABC is equal to the product of their respective uh, probabilities. So what does it mean? So because the ABC are independent, so which means that, so actually if you're interested in the probability of A, so if you know that both B and C have occurred, this should not change the probability of A, right? Because they're independent. They should have nothing to do with each other. So this time, you not only know B, you not only know C, you know that both of them have occurred. So that probability, that conditional probability should be like this. The probability of A given B intersect C, right? And because they're independent, it should be equal to the probability of A, this unconditional probability, right? Then, now let's check this, uh, uh, this conditional probability, A given B intersect C. So if we check that by the definition of conditional probability, uh, it should be equal to the product of A intersect so the condition, so which is uh, A intersect B intersect C, right? which is the numerator. The denominator is the probability of the condition, right? And here, you know that because uh, A, B, C are independent, and by the last three conditions, if we take any two of them, those two events should be independent, right? So B and C are independent, so the probability of uh, B intersect C should be equal to the probability of B times probability of C. So now we have, uh, so this result, right? And from this result, because we know that this guy should be equal to the unconditional probability of A, right? So in other words, 
So there's a probability of A times the denominator should be equal to the numerator. So which means uh, this, right? So you see, that explains why we need the first condition. The meaning of first condition is just like this. So if you know that both A, uh, both B and C have occurred, this will not help you to know more about A, right? So you have three guys, three events. You take any two of them. You know one will not help you to know more about the other, right? And you pick all three of them. If you know that two of them has a, have occurred, it will not help you to know more about the other one. So that's the meaning. So that's why it's defined in this way. So this is the definition of independence of three events. And actually, this idea uh, can be extended to uh, independence of uh, actually many events. Say we have four events. How to define independence of them? So just we just need to follow the same idea. So which means that if we pick any two of them, it should be independent. So which means that we need to have conditions like those three guys. And uh, among the four events, if we pick any three of them, they should also be independent. And if we pick all four of them, they should be independent. Right? So that's the complete definition of uh, four events, five events, and so on. We pick any number of them, they should be independent. So we will have a condition similar to that but I, I would just let you know the idea. And uh, I think uh, in the exam, I won't, I won't test you uh, about more than three events uh, about independence. Uh, let's see an uh, exercise uh, problem. So in this problem, actually, uh, we consider the so-called the parallel system. So what is a parallel system? Uh, suppose we have a system uh, composed of n uh, separate components. So it is said to be a parallel system if the entire system works as long as at least one of the components works. Right? So you may think of uh, a parallel system as a, as a circuit like this. So suppose that so we have uh, n switches, and uh, the electric current may flow from A to B as long as at least one switch is closed. Right? One switch is as long as uh, um, one of them is, uh, is closed, then there is a path from A to B. And uh, the, the current will flow from A to B, right? So this is a, a very simple example of a parallel system. So suppose for component I, independent of other components, so it works with probability Ti. Then what is the probability that the entire system works. So that is this uh, this this, uh, this question. 
So as I said, it's just like uh, like in this uh, picture. So as long as one of the switches is closed, then it works, right? So how to how to solve this problem? Essentially, we wish to know so this this probability, the probability that the entire system works, right? And recall that the entire system works means that at least one component works. It's okay if two compo component works, three works, and so on, right? At least one works is fine. So we may define uh, events like this. Say we use a base of I uh, for the event, the component I, component I works, right? So AI stands for this. Then by the statement of this uh, uh, problem, the probability of AI should be equal to PI. And then, uh, as I just said, uh, the entire system works means uh, at least one works. It could be two, it could be three, right? So if you wish to analyze all of them, it could be a bit more complicated. However, you will see that uh, the probability of uh, the opposite, if we consider so this event, which is a uh, system does not function, does not work. So there's only one case that the entire system cannot work, which means all components are bad, right? Only when all components are bad, then the, the, the system cannot work, right? So this, this one is very easy to consider because uh, <coughs> This probability actually is equal to the probability that no components function. And uh, because uh, we know that the compo uh, those components uh, function independently, whether the first guy works, it will not affect this, whether the second guy works and so on, right? So no components functions. So this event essentially just means uh, the first component does not work, the second component does not work, and so on, right? So, which is the intersection of uh, A1 complement, A2 complement, and so on. The probability of intersection of all those complements. And because we know that each event is independent of others, Right? So, so component I independent of others functions with probability P, right? So the probability of the intersection should be equal to the product of their respective probabilities because of independence. So, so this probability is equal to the product. And what is the what is this product? And each one is just a, a AI complement because we know the probability of AI is PI, so the probability of their complements should be one minus P1, one minus P2, and so on, right? So that's a <coughs> so you see that's a, that's the answer. So this one. Uh, <coughs> actually describe the, the probability that a parallel system works, a parallel system with n components works, right? So why, why bother to consider so this, this question? Because uh, uh, I wish to use this very simple example to, to let you know uh, a very fundamental Principle in uh, reliability engineering, so which which means that uh, by by introducing redundancy, you can you can have a, a more reliable system. How can we uh, understand this? So maybe it's better for us to plug in some numbers. 
so into this uh, so into into this formula. So this formula, we know that is uh, the probability that the entire system works, right? And this entire system has n parallel components. So suppose that the probability that uh, each component works with probability one half, right? You just flip a coin, so 50% of chance this component is, is, is good, otherwise it's bad. If we have six such components, then if we plug so this number into this formula, you can see that the probability that the entire system works would be more than 98%. So it's close to one, right? So if you think of this uh, uh, example a bit more, so you see that if we check each component, it's either good or bad, 50-50 chance, right? So in no, in no means we can claim that this component is reliable, right? However, if those components can work in a parallel way, and we have uh, five five cups for a, a component. Then the reliability of the entire system can be increased a lot. But one component it only works with 50% of chance. But if we have six such components working in a parallel way, then with more than 98%, the entire system is good. Right. So you see that by introducing by cup components, the entire system will be much, much more reliable, right? And actually, uh, in practice, we have uh, a lot of such examples. If you wish to increase reliability, you need to have backups. So for example, we know that for, for airplanes, Aircrafts. So all planes have more than one engine. It could have two, it could have three. In some rare case, it may have four engines. Why is so? Because uh, if a plane has only one engine and it's uh, flying in the air, suddenly the engine fails, that would be a disaster. Right? If it has more than one engine, if one fails, the other one can be used as a backup. It works and it was still safe, right? So that's uh, one example. Another example, maybe in, in hospitals. So you, you may know that in general hospitals, actually, they have uh, they have generators. So why they need generators? Because uh, so they need power. They always need power especially for for operating rooms, right? If there is a suddenly a blackout, power grid failure, no power in operating room, and uh, so then it could be a disaster. So it must have some backup generator. In case of blackouts, the generator will be started automatically so that all surgical procedures can move on and so on, right? So that's uh, <coughs> the basic principle. By studying so this uh, uh, probability, you will see that you have redundancy and uh, it can help you to increase uh, reliability. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's another uh, result. I won't prove that, but uh, I think, uh, uh, and, and it is very easy to understand, but you, you, you may need to keep it in mind. So what, what is this result? Actually, you only need to memorize the, the title of this page. It means that conditional probability is probability. What does it mean? So let's think of uh, conditional probability again. So as I said, what, what, what is conditional probability describes. So it means that originally you have a sample space, right? After you know some information, then the sample space will shrink from the capital omega into some 
is empty. Right? So then, after this happens, then the, the probability will change from unconditional probability to conditional probability. Now, it comes to a question that can this conditional probability satisfy all the requirements of an ordinary probability? Right? So what is ordinary probability? So we, which means that when we talk about probabilities, in our mind, we need to think of a probability space. Right? What is a probability space? So you have three parts, simple space, a collection of events, and a rule, which is called a probability. After knowing this extra piece of information, essentially, the simple space will, will be changed. Right? So now, essentially, you will have a new probability space. You have something new. But you need to check whether this new stuff satisfies the, all the conditions the probability space should satisfy. So that, that's why we need to consider this. And of course, the result is, uh, the answer is yes. So after you know a piece of information, then essentially your sample space <coughs> will be shrink. But with this new sample space, and uh, you use the conditional probability as an ordinary probability, in this new sample space. All the conditions a probability requires should all should still be satisfied. So that, that's why we need to introduce this. So, which means that if you need to deal with the conditional probability, then you don't, you don't have to care too much because it satisfies all the probabilities an ordinary, uh, unconditional probability should satisfy. Right? So, in other words, it's just like this title suggests, conditional probability is a probability. It satisfies all properties an uh, unconditional probability should have. That's it. Right? So, <coughs> actually, uh, <coughs> what do we how to prove this, what we really need is to, to verify that the conditional probability still satisfies the three conditions in the definition of probability space, right? But it is not difficult. I just leave it as an as a exercise, exercise problem. I leave it to you. Uh, okay, so then uh, I think we just uh, finished the... Finish uh, to this part, and before I move to a new topic, uh, any questions? Okay, uh, so next we will discuss uh, a random variables. So what is a, what is a random variable? Maybe um, let me introduce the, the conception of that uh, by a very simple example. So uh, in this example, suppose that uh, there are two friends, and you call, just call them Tom and Jerry. And there are two gamblers. The game is just like this. They're rolling a die, which is a fair die. If the outcome is one, two, three, then Tom wins one dollar. Otherwise, if the outcome is four, five, or six, Jerry wins one dollar. Right? And uh, uh, because uh, 
it is a gamble where it is a random experiment. The outcome cannot, cannot be known in advance, right? So maybe you can use uh, this X, kappa X, for Tom's game of a particular day, right? So in each game, Tom either wins one dollar or loses one dollar. So which means that this X could be one, could be minus one, depending on the outcome. Again, so this uh, this X could be one or minus one, depending on the outcome, right? In other words, if you know the outcome, you can specify the value of X, right? So in this sense, you see that actually, so this X can be represented as a function of outcome, right? The rule of the game is like this. If the outcome is one, two, three, so this X is one. If the outcome is four, five, six, so this, uh, this X takes the value minus one, right? So now you see, what is this X? This X is just a, a function of the outcome. We associate a real number with each outcome. So then, what is a random variable? This X is a random variable. So the definition of a random variable is, is pretty simple. It is just a real value function of all comes. You have a random experiment. For this random experiment, so each time it's performed, you will see an outcome. And this outcome will determine the value of a random variable. Because a random variable is just a function of all comes, right? So this X is a random variable, again, so it's a, it's a function of all comes. If the outcome is a 1, 2, 3, it is equal to 1. If the outcome is 4, 5, 6, it is equal to minus 1. So this is a random variable x. And similarly, we can define a random variable for Jerry, for Jerry's game, right? So we know that, so the, the, the rule of the game for Jerry is just the opposite side of Paul. If Tom wins, means Jerry loses, right? So if we use Y for Jerry's game for that one, then what is uh, Y1 up to Y6? So this one should be very simple, right? So it's just uh, so Y1 is just equal to minus 1, Y2 minus 1. Y4, Y5, Y6 is, should be equal to what for Jerry, right? So this is an <coughs> example of a random variable. So that said, what is the definition of a random variable? A random variable is just a function that assigns a real number to each outcome in a sample space, right? You have a random experiment, you see outcome, and then the value of the random variable should be determined. We know the value of that. So why we wish to know, why we, 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 we need to introduce the conception of uh, random variables, because uh, as in this example, sometimes we are, we are more interested in the certain numerical aspects of outcomes rather than the outcomes themselves, right? So for in, in this example, Suppose you're Tom, then the outcome, whether it's one or two or three, will be the same for you. You will care whether I will win or lose in this game. Whether it's one, one, two, three will be the same for you. Four, five, six will be the same for you, right? So in this case, it will be more, it will be more uh, important to to focus on whether you win or not, not the it may not be the specific outcomes, right? So that's the idea. So then uh, the 
definition is like this. And because uh, the random variable is just a, a real value of the function of outcomes, then maybe we need to review some basic conceptions for uh, real numbers, for uh, some convention, for notation, and so on. So usually, uh, <coughs> we use this letter R for the set of uh, real numbers from now on. And uh, so what is a random variable? Actually, this random variable can be denoted as something like this. So we know that it is a, a function of all comps, right? But then we also know that we, we typically use this capital omega for the sample space. And uh, we also know that as a convention, we usually use this lower uh, lowercase omega for an all comp. So lowercase omega for a general all comp and the capital omega for sample space. Then what is a what is a random variable? It's a random variable. It's just a function of the outcome, which takes a real value, right? So mathematically, it's defined in this way. And uh, there's certain uh, conventions. So for example, usually we use uh, capital letters for random variables. So capital letters, x and y, z, and so on, for uh, random variables. And uh, for if we if we use lowercase letters, usually it means deterministic numbers, real number, fixed number, no randomness. But for capital letters, uh, the random variables. And there is a another uh, a commonly used notation like this. So. Suppose we have uh, a random variable x, capital X, and uh, this b, capital B, is a, a set of real numbers. And sometimes uh, you will see notation like this. So within a pair of curly brackets, uh, so you see x in B. So we need to we need to memorize the meaning of this guy, of this notation. What does this mean? The definition of this notation is like this. So let's check what is this. So first, you see, so this notation means a, a set, right? So this set is a set of all comps, a set of lowercase omegas. A set, what is a set of omega? Uh, what is a set of all comps? It should be event, right? Then, what is this event? So this notation means that so it is a set of all comps at which this random variable takes value in B. So again, what is this B? This B is a set of real numbers. And this notation means a set of all comps. What all comps? The set of all comps at which the random variables takes value in B. You may still feel a bit confused, but it's OK, because uh, I will give you some examples. And, and I, I believe you will understand this very well in five minutes. So then, but anyway, at this stage, for, for, for the time being, you only need to know that this notation stands for event. What is an event? Event is a set of outcomes, right? And we know that, so if it is an event, then it makes sense to talk about the probability of it. Because probability is defined over events, right? So then, because if it's an event, then it makes sense to write something like this. What is the probability that x takes a value in b? So then, based on all this, according to this definition, it is just the probability of events or probability of set of outcomes at which x takes a value in b. So now, I'll give you some examples. 
So in a previous example, in the Tom Jerry example, let's see what is the set x takes the value of 1. According to that definition, this should be the set of all comps at which Tom wins 1 to 1. Right? So what is that event? So if the all comp of the fair die is 1, 2, 3, Tom wins 1 to 1. Right? So then the probability that the, 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 the event x takes the value 1, what is that? It is just the set of 1, 2, 3. And uh, because it is event, it makes sense to talk about the probability of that. So what is the probability that x takes 1? Or what is the probability that Tom wins 1 over? It is just the probability that the outcome is either 1, 2, or 3. 3 over 4, which is 1 half, right? So this is, uh, I, I think now we understand this very well. So next, let's see. What is the set x takes minus 1? So which means uh, Tom loses 1 to 1. Or the outcome should be 4, 5, or 6. Right? So the probability of x takes minus 1 should be 3 over 6, also 1 half. Right? So now, let's think of this. What is this set? X takes value 0. So first, what is X? X is Tom's again. It could be 1, it could be minus 1. Right? So depending on the all comp. We have totally 6 all, all comps. For each outcome, x takes either 1 or minus 1, right? But this time, we consider the case x takes value 0. Is it possible? It's not possible, right? No matter what outcome, x cannot take 0. What does it mean? It means this event must be empty, right? So we know that the probability of that we said is zero. No outcome satisfies this condition. So if we consider probability x takes zero, no such outcome is the probability of empty set, which would be zero, right? So then let's think of what is the set x takes the value less than or equal to four. So, x could be 1 or minus 1. No matter 1 or minus 1, it would be less than or equal to 4, right? So, which means that all outcomes should be within this set. So, this set means uh, everything. It's the sample space, right? So, the probability that x takes the value less than or equal to 4 should be into 1. I think it's uh, it's clear. And maybe we can consider one more example. So this time uh, we flip two fair dice. So then, so this x will be the, the sum of two fair dice, right? So the, the so for, for one die, you could see one up to six, right? And the, this x is just the sum. So let's first think of the, the set. What is the x take value two? The sum of two fair dice would be two, so which means that each one must be one, right? 
you have a pair of dies. Each one is one. So this event actually is just so it has only one alcohol, which is one one. First die is one, the second die is one, right? And uh, what is the probability? The probability of this event is just the probability of this uh, single alcohol, right? If we have a pair, a pair of dies, then totally we have uh, six by six, hopefully 36 alcohols, right? And this is only one over 36, so the probability is uh, one over 36. So, <coughs> What is this set? X takes five. X takes five. So there are four possible cases. It is possible that the first die is one, the second die is four, or the first is two, second is three, and so on, right? Or three, two, four, one. And uh, there are four cases. So the probability that x takes five would just be four outcomes out of totally 36 outcomes. So it's uh, one night. So this is uh, mm -hmm. an example. Maybe we can consider uh, another example. So this example could be uh, a bit more complicated. So suppose I'm taking a, a driving test to have my driver's license. So you know that the driving test is like this. Uh, if I fail, then I cannot pass this time. But I'm allowed to to have the test again in the future. So I can repeat my test again and again until I pass it. Right? Once I pass it, it's done. I pass the entire driving exam. So once I pass it, I can have the lessons. Now let's consider the results of my tests until I get the lessons. So again, it's possible that I take once, I get my lessons, which means that I pass for, for the first test, right? It is also possible that I fail the first, then I need to take it again, and the second, I, I pass. It's also okay. And uh, we can do this, actually, we just uh, need to have this uh, test again and again until I have the first pass. Then receive the lessons, right? You can see, in this way, if we wish to describe the sample space, the sample space can be described in this way. If we use P for pass and F for fail, it is possible that I get my lessons by just one test, which means that I pass in the first test or second or I got my lessons by two tests, which means fail the first one and pass the second one, and so on, right? So you see, for this sample space, actually, it has uh, infinitely many outcomes. At least, uh, theoretically, I can, I can have arbitrarily many fails until I get a pass, right? So that's the, the sample space. Then, uh, if we use this x for the number of tests I take until I get the lessons, is this x a random variable? The answer, of course, is yes. It's a random variable. Why is a random variable? The first, the by definition, random variable is just a, a function of uh, outcome, right? You know the outcome, then you know the value of this random variable. So, you see, 
the sample space is like this, and the, the outcomes will be like this. So any outcome, as long as you know the outcome, say it's F, 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 P, then you know the value of X would be, for this one, would be four, right? You pass, you pass at the, the, the fourth exam, right? So once you know the outcome, you know the value of X, then X would be one variable. Then, what is X? As I said, if the outcome is P, you know that you only need one pass. X is one. If it's FP, it should be two, and so on. Right? So this is the, another example of a, a random variable. So here's another example. We know that actually for, for driving paths, uh, for, for to, to, to get a driver's license, you need to have two tests. The first one is driving test, and uh, probably before that, you need to pass a theory test, right? So the theory test, usually you need to, you need to sit in front of a computer, and uh, you have to answer a number of, uh, of choice questions, right? If the if your number of correct answers uh, is above a certain number, you pass. Otherwise, you fail. Right? That's the rule for the theory test. So, suppose for this theory test, uh, there are totally 25 questions. And I need to answer at least 20 questions correctly to pass the exam. And the uh, Suppose that for each question, I can give the right answer with probability P, and the correctness of different answers are independent. Independent, again, independent means uh, whether I answer the first question correctly, so this would not affect the correctness of my, of my answer to the second question, and so on, right? So then, by this Y, be the number of uh, my correct answers. So think of this problem. Uh, the first question is, is this y a random variable? Of course it should be, right? So y is a random variable because a uh, random variable is defined as a function of outcome, right? So for this uh, problem, actually, you don't really need to specify the sample space. As long as you understand that. So the principle is, as long as you know the outcome of all those 25 questions, you know, you know the results of all 25 questions, whether the first one is correct, or whether the second one is correct, and so on, then you can determine the value of the y. So then you see that this y must be a function of all comes, so it must be a random variable. And then, for this one, maybe let's uh, think of the probability that the answer some questions correctly. What will be that? Will be that? So here, uh, it is important to assume independence between different answers, right? So. What is the probability that I have n correct answers? So y is equal to n, so we have totally 25 questions to answer, right? So those n answers, we may have different combinations, right? The number of uh, different combinations will be 25 choose n. So totally 25 questions, among them, n would be correct. So I have 25 choose n ways to, to have n questions, to have n correct answers, right? That's the number of ways. And in each way, I should have n correct answers and 25 minus n wrong answers, right? 
because uh, so the answers are independent, for those then correct answers, each one will be correct with probability p. So the total, because I have totally incorrect answers, the probability of that should be p to the power n, right? Then if I consider the rest of 25 minus n answers, because all of them are wrong, and each one would be wrong with probability 1 minus p. So the probability would be 1 minus p to the power 25 minus n, right? Why can I do this uh, multiplication? Because they're independent, right? So all of them are wrong, the probability would be the, the product. So, <coughs> and actually, uh, so this is uh, how to how to calculate the, the, the probability that y takes value n, right? Again, so we have 25 choose n ways, and in each way, so this is the probability that I have n uh, correct answers and 25 minus n uh, wrong answers, right? And what is the probability that I pass the theory test? Uh, we just uh, need to think of what is the probability that y takes a value bigger or equal to 20. How to calculate that? I just uh, sum up. So this is the probability for n bigger or equal to 20. Then I will have this probability. And you see that in this uh, expression, uh, I use, uh, so this 25 choose n. I would say it's, uh, it's important for you. It's important for you to to memorize how to calculate i choose n when n is bigger or equal to n. I think it's a, you know, first homework, right? So how to calculate this, m choose n, so in the numerator it should be m times m minus 1 times up to m minus n plus 1. In the denominator it should be n factorial. Or, so this can also be calculated in this way, m factorial over m minus n factorial times n factorial. Why you must know this? Because it will appear in your exams. You must know this. So let's see uh, one more example. So uh, in this example, suppose that I'm a farmer and I have a, a cow farm. And each, each day, uh, the cows produce milk. And I, I sell milk at $2 per liter. So each day, I produce the milk that actually is a, is a random amount. It's equally random between uh, 2,500 and and uh, 5,000 liters. So, so this amount is a random, so let's consider the amount of milk uh, produced tomorrow. Because it's, uh, it will happen tomorrow, so it's, uh, it's random, right? It's random variable. In this example, what is the sample space? So the sample space can be defined in this way because uh, the amount of milk could be between 4,500 and 1,500. So the sample space, just I just take the sample space as an interval. Interval between those two numbers. And uh, if this x be tomorrow's revenue of form, what is that? So you will see that because uh, the outcome could be any number between this interval and the uh, the 
milk is, is, is sold at $2 uh, a liter. So this uh, X of the outcome is just equal to two times the outcome, right? So this outcome is just the amount of uh, milk I will have tomorrow. So first is two times the outcome is just a, a function of outcome. It's a random variable, right? So this is a, another very simple example. But actually, if you uh, you check this example, you compare this example from previous example, um, this, exa this example is, uh, is a bit different. Why well, I said so, because uh, in this example, so this uh, all com, this omega could be any. So this, this x, so this, this random variable could take any value within the interval. So in previous examples, so in this example, in this example, the random variable can only take values in a discrete set. It can only have finitely many values or countably many values. So later I will explain what, what does this countably many mean. So, but anyway, you see that it can only take discrete values, one, two, three, and so on. In this example, it uh, could be 0, 1, up to 25, right? But in this example, it could be any number within the interval. So then you, you ask me a question, why bother to survive this uh, difference? Because later you will see, for this type of uh, random variables, it is called a continuous random variable. We will need to use a, a different tool to study it as compared with uh, so such random variables. So we should just take discrete values because we need to use different tool. So we need to, at this stage, we need to differentiate those two type, type of random variables. So this one is discrete random variables, and this one is a continuous random variable. So I think later I will explain more. Uh, any questions? So if no question, uh, we can have uh, a break of 10 minutes. Let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, before the break, uh, we introduced uh, uh, continuous random variables and, uh, and uh, continuous random variables. So now let me uh, give you the, the definition. So what is a discrete random variable? If a random variable can only take countably many values, then it is called a uh, discrete random variable. So here, uh, of course, you see that the, the key word is this uh, countably many, right? What does countably many mean? So it means uh, either, so we consider a set because uh, a random variable needs to take a value of uh, a set of, uh, uh, the value would be a set of real numbers, right? So let's consider the set that this uh, random variable can take value from. Because if it is a set, then we need to consider how many elements are there. If the number of elements is either finite or the number of elements is infinite, but all of these elements can be listed as the first element and the second element and so on, then such a set is called a countable set. A countable set has a countably many elements, right? So there are two cases. The first case that if we have finite number of elements, of course, 
So we can list all of them, right? Random numbers. Then we know who's the first and who's the second. It is also possible that we have uh, infinitely many elements, but we're able to list them. So as the first one, and second one, and so on, right? So, so for such an example, so let me give you an example. Let's consider the set of uh, positive numbers, right? Set of positive numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on, right? We just list all of them in this way. If you point out a number, you say, you ask me, what is the position of uh, 105 in a list? Then I can tell you that it's uh, in position 105, right? Because I can list all of them. And I, I can give you the position. So, so in this case, you can see the set of all possible numbers is uh, uh, is countable, right? And also, uh, there are other examples of countable sets. So, the set of all integers, the set of rational numbers. We can find ways to list all of them. And uh, as long as well as as you get to the position of uh, any number in my list, I can tell you, then such a set of numbers is called a countable many. So, uh, <coughs> but you may ask me the question: So why why bother to introduce this notion? I think the the essential reason is that if we have a, a, countably, a countable set of numbers, then it is possible to define addition over these numbers. For, for example, if this countable set is just finite, we have finitely many numbers, real numbers. Of course, we can add them together. Right, because we can, we can only find many numbers. It is also possible to define addition for countably many, so which means uh, infinite, but we can list all of them. As long as we can list all of them, we can point out the position of them. So we can add them as the first one, second one, and so on, add them together. So we can define addition for that. Because we can define addition, then, for discrete random variables, if we wish to know the probability or whatever, because it only we, we can only count so the probability at different values and add them together, so we can use addition. So that's the essential essential reason. So, and in contrast, so. We can think of we can think of continuous random variables. In the previous example, here, so this X is a continuous random variable. So what does this mean? It can be any value within the interval. The definition of that is like this: if a random variable can take uncountably many values. And uh, for each real number A, the probability that X takes A must be equal to zero. Then such a random variable is called a continuous random variable. So according to this definition, uh, it may seem confusing at first glance. So I may need some time to explain this. So first, we need to understand what does this uh, uncountably many mean. So first, uncountably many means infinite. It must be infinite. It is not only infinite. You need to understand that it's more than countably many. So here, 
sum of the many may also be infinite, right? So if we consider the set of positive numbers, all positive numbers, we know the number of uh, the co uh, positive numbers is, is infinite, right? But uncountably many means uh, the number of uh, elements that could be more than the number of positive integers. So for example, if we consider the number of real numbers within the interval, we can prove that the number of that must be much, much bigger than the number of positive integers. Of course, how to define this is, a, is another question, and I won't, I won't explain that here. But, so why we need to differentiate it, countable set and the uncountable set? Because uh, if a random variable may take uncountably many different values, then to calculate the probability, we cannot simply use addition. Because uh, for, for those values, we, can, we cannot list them as the first one, second one, and so on. We cannot define addition. So that's the issue. So later, you will see that we must uh, use uh, uh, integral to calculate probabilities. So that's that's why we need to uh, introduce discrete random variable and continuous random variable separately, because we need different mathematical tools for analyzing them. So that's the reason. So uh, maybe you need to memorize some, some examples of uh, uncountable sets. So the entire set of real numbers so is an uncountable set. And uh, the set of uh, positive real numbers is also uncountable. And any interval of real line is, uh, is uncountable. So these are a common used example. So, uh, <coughs> So let's, let's come back to this definition. We may need to think a bit more of that. So what is a continuous random variable? Uh, it can take uncountably many different values. And at each value, each real value, the probability of that is, is zero, right? This is the definition. But some of you may feel confused because uh, Because uh, you may think of uh, a question like this. So here, suppose we have uh, a continuous random variable. We we'll call it X, capital X, right? Then first, well, let's think of the probability that X takes a value in the entire set of real numbers. So we know that what is uh, X? X is a is a random variable. What is a random variable? A random variable is just a real value of the function of a count. Okay. So you gave me an outcome, I gave you a real number. So no matter what the outcome is, the output of that function must be a real number. Right? So if we think of this event, x take a real value, it is simply the entire simple space. Right? So then, what is the probability that x take any value in the real line? It's the probability of the sample space, which is 1. Right? However, if you check the definition of continuous random variable, it requires that at any specific real value a, any 1, the probability that it takes a must be equal to 0. Right? You have a bunch of uh, points. At each point, the probability that it takes that point is zero. But if you consider the entire line, the probability within the line is one. Right? It seems a bit confusing. Because uh, you may think that, so 
if we put a lot of zeros together, add them together, eventually we'll have one. Why this can happen? Right? Well, it seems something wrong there. So how to explain this? And actually, um, so it is still okay. Why it is okay? Because I just said we cannot define addition for uncountably many numbers. Because so we cannot list them all of them. If we can list all of them, the first one, second one, and so on, then it might be okay to add them together. So even if it's infinite, we can take a limit and so on. It could be okay. But if uh, uncountably many, then we cannot define addition. Because addition cannot be defined, then it doesn't make sense to think of add them together, add up a lot of zeros to have one. It doesn't make sense because it's undefined. That's the explanation. Right? It's not that intuitive, but it's, uh, it's like this. I think later, <coughs> uh, I will, I will give you a, a more specific example, maybe in, in two weeks. So how to, how to uh, construct a continuous discrete, uh, distribution by discrete distribution. And I think uh, uh, at that time, you will have a, a better understanding of why continuous uh, random variables must be defined in this way, right? But for the time being, please just accept it. So, so this is the definition of uh, continuous random variable. Now let's uh, uh, let's go back to check. So, it's square random variables. Then, uh, recall the, the definition of uh, discrete random variables is like this. So, if a random variable can take at most accountably many different values, it is called discrete random variable. Then, <coughs> the question is how can we? Specify where, how can we describe the behavior of discrete random variable? Actually, the way of that is a pretty straightforward because they can only take at most probability many different values. How to describe those probability? We just list because countably means we can list all of them, right? We just need to list the probability of that random variable taking each specific value. As long as we can list all of them, we will understand behavior. It is a very straightforward way. So for example, <coughs> in the gambling example uh, at the beginning of this topic, Tom and Jerry's example, we know that this X is the, the, the gain of, of Tom in the, in the game. It could be one, it could be minus one. So to understand, so this, uh, this random variable is, uh, is very simple. To understand it's uh, the so-called distributional behavior, we only need to list the probability that it takes one and minus one, right? So then it's a one half, one half. And uh, maybe we can also think of the the driving test example. So recall that the driving test example is like this. Uh, I need to take this test again and again until I have the first pass. So I have the first pass, then I get the lessons. It's over. It's done, right? So then uh, this X is the number of tests I would I will have until I get my lessons. So this X, as I explained, it could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be any positive integer, right? 
then to describe the, the behavior of uh, the discri uh, distributional behavior of X, then how can we do that? We just need to specify the probability that X takes the value K. So this K is just an arbitrary positive integer, right? So what is that probability? X takes value K means that I need K tests to get my lessons, right? K tests means uh, I failed the first K minus one tests and the past the last one, right? So if all those tests are independent, so the probability and the, so the probability a pass a test is a p. Then, because I failed the first k minus one tests, because each one is independent, the probability of that would be one minus p, which is the probability that I fail for each test, right? Because I failed the k minus one tests, it's one minus p to the power of k minus one, and uh, I pass the last one. The probability of that is p, so this probability must be equal to this, 1 minus p to the power of k minus 1 times p, which is the, because I pass the last one. So this is uh, this probability, x is equal to k. And uh, also in the theory test example, so recall that I need to answer 25 questions and for each question, the probability of uh, correctness is p, right? The probability that I answer them correct, uh, answer n of them correctly would be something like this. I explained before the break, right? So you see, that's the way to specify the distribution of y. y is the number of correct answers, right? So you see, uh, in, in these examples, so that's the, the very straightforward way to describe the distributional uh, behavior of those uh, discrete random variables. And actually, uh, so we can use this idea to define uh, a notion called probability mass function. So what is the probability mass function? So probability mass function is only defined where discrete random variable. So if this x is a discrete random variable, the probability mass function of that is simply defined as this. So we need to consider all possible values this random variable, this discrete random variable may take. So if this uh, lowercase x is a possible value, then at this value, we use this lowercase p for this p m f. This p of lowercase x is simply defined to be the probability that this random variable takes the value lowercase x. So this is a definition of uh, p m f. So again, the idea of PMF is pretty straightforward. We just list the probability of uh, uh, possible values of random variable, this discrete random variable may take, right? And because, uh, and also, so this, we may also think of this uh, lowercase x as a value that this random variable may not take. And in this case, this p of lowercase x is simply equal to zero, right? And in this way, actually, this p m f can be defined over the entire real line. But because this random variable is a discrete random variable, there are at most commonly many values. This uh, p m f can be bigger than zero, right? Because as a PMF is a probability, so at any point, it must be bigger than or equal to zero. And uh, there are the most probably many points at which this PMF can be bigger than zero. So that's the proper 
and also because it is a, a probability, and if we sum up uh, over all possible values this random variable can take, then eventually, so the sum will be equal to 1. So this is PMF. So uh, let me give you an example of this PMF. Uh, so this is the this is uh, what the PMF of the current test example uh, looks like, right? So here, suppose that the probability to pass uh, each driving test uh, would be 20%, right? And as we explained just just now, uh, the probability that uh, the number of tests that you should take is equal to k follows this expression. And uh, if we draw a picture of those probabilities, uh, you see that this x can only take values at positive integers, right? Say that 1 with probability uh, 20% is, is 1, and after that it will decrease but only at positive integers, it will take a value bigger than zero. At all other values, it's equal to zero. So that's PMF. And this is the example of the um, theory test example. That answer 25 questions. And this Y is the number of uh, uh, correct answers. It could be zero up to 25, right? Uh, so here, because of this, here we only need to consider um, consider from zero up to 25. But actually, this PMF can be defined over the entire real line, but only from zero up to 25. So they can take uh, the probability could be positive, right? And uh, uh, they follow this formula. Actually, even it is even at zero, it is not really it is not zero, but it, because it's too small, so it's see, so it's uh, very close to zero. But you need to understand that all those at all those dots, so the PMF is positive. So this is a uh, that example. And uh, uh, there's another way to describe the. The distribution of a, of a random variable, so which is called cumulative distribution function, or CDF. So what is a CDF? CDF is defined in, in this way. So we usually use this capital F to denote the CDF of a random variable. So the CDF of a random variable X is defined in this way for each real number, lowercase x. F of lowercase x is defined as the probability that when a variable takes a value less than or equal to this lowercase x. Right? So this is the definition of CDF. So again, probability that when a variable takes a value less than or equal to lowercase x for any real number x. So, we can, so you may ask me the, the question, we already have a PMF, probability mass function. Why bother to introduce this uh, CDF? It seems that it should be the same thing, right? So the answer is like this. So uh, actually, this PMF is defined for discrete random variables, right? And it is a very straightforward way to s describe the distribution, the probability distribution of a discrete uh, discrete random variable, because it just specifies the probabilities at different values, right? However, as I explained. For continuous random variables, so we cannot define PMF for that. But it is uh, 
we can still define CDF for continuous random variables. So whether a random variable is discrete or continuous or a mixture of discrete and uh, continuous or neither of them, whatever, so we can define, we can always define CDF for whatever random variable. But sometimes we may not be able to define so PMF for certain random variables. So in this way, you actually can see the CDF will be a more general or more powerful tool for describing the distribution of a random variable. It's more general. So that's why we need to introduce the CDF. And then, so, uh, of course, so you may expect that if we know the PMF of a discrete random variable, then according to this definition, we should be able to specify the CDF of that, right? So how do we do that? Actually, it's, uh, it's not difficult. So for example, if we wish to know this F of lowercase x, and then by this definition, we know that it's, a, it's simply the probability like this. When the variable takes a value that's not equal to this lowercase x. And uh, if the PMF of that is known, then how to get this probability? So we just need to consider so the possible values this x, this random variable may take. So such values less than or equal to x, and sum up, sum up them, sum them up together. Right? Then we will have this uh, probability. Then from the PMF, we can derive this uh, CDF. So, and also, uh, if you know the CDF, you can also derive uh, PMF. So, uh, because uh, for discrete random variables that are equivalent. So maybe uh, I will use uh, <coughs> an example to, to explain how we may uh, derive, uh, derive them uh, each other from when, uh, so from CDF to PMF and from PMF to CDF. So uh, <coughs> let's consider a question like this. So suppose we have a, a, a random variable kappa x uh, which has a distribution like this. The PMF of that is given uh, in this little table. So this random variable may take five different values. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Right? The probability of those four different values uh, are like uh, 5%, 10%, 35%, and so on, like this, right? Then, so given this PMF, let's see what is the CDF of this, uh, of this random variable. So again, so this question is, uh, is like this. Uh, the PMF is, uh, is here, is like, like this. Then we wish to know the, the CDF of this, right? So that's around a variable. Uh, we know that it can only take five different values, right? Because it can only take five different values, maybe we can first think of uh, uh, the CDF and those five values because I can, I cannot take any other value, right? Then uh, those five values could be one, two, four, and so on. Let's consider what will be the uh, value at those points. So first, so let's consider what is the CDF at one because one is the first value it may take, right? By definition, uh, capital F of y uh, of one, f of one, is just the probability that 
to win a verbal takes a value less than or equal to one. Right? By definition. And because uh, this run of variable can only take uh, three different values, and it is the smallest one, and uh, the only chance that x takes a value less than or equal to one is that it takes one. Right? So what is this probability? Is the probability that it takes one, which is 5%. It is the average first point. The second point is two. So at this point, uh, we need to consider the probability that when a variable takes a value less than or equal to 2. If x takes a value less than or equal to 2, in this case, there are two possibilities, right? It can either take 1 or 2. So this probability would be 5% plus 10%, 15%. So the next one, we need to consider 4. For four, we need to consider probability that when the variable takes a value less than or equal to four. We have three possible cases, one, two, four, right? So they have probability 5%, 10%, 25%. Add them together, we have 50%. Right? We just need to do this for all five values. And uh, at eight, it turns out that the probability will be 0.9, and uh, at 16, it will become 1, right? So here, you see that we can only take, at most, five different values, and the largest one is 16, right? So then, f of 16, which is the probability that takes a value less than or equal to 16, it must be equal to 1. Because, uh, so this will include all possibilities. So this one must be, f of 16 must be equal to 1. So now, so in this way you can see that we can specify the, CD, the value of CDF at those five points, right? And then next, let's consider the value of CDF at other points. Those five, using those, using uh, those five points, so the entire real line will be divided into different parts. So let's consider each part, each interval, right? So the first one, the first point is one. Maybe let's uh, first consider so f of lowercase x for x less than one, right? So if x less than 1, the definition, the CDF, is just the probability when the variable takes a value less than or equal to x. Because uh, x is less than 1, then no possibilities, right? So 1 is the smallest, the smallest value we can take. So this probability must be 0. Then let's consider the next interval. If this lower is x is bigger or equal to 1 or less than 2, because uh, it's between so this interval, right? Then if this lower x is between 1 and 2, x can only take 1. That's the only possibility, right? So in this case, if uh, when the variable takes a value, so less than x for x between 1 and 2, then it must take 1. The probability would be 5%, right? We just uh, keep on doing this. So next, if we consider this x in the next interval, which is between 2 and 4, right? In this case, the random variable may take 1 or 2. In this case, the probability would be for this, right? We just keep on doing this and uh, discuss in this way. Then we can specify um, all values of the CDF over the entire line, right? So it looks like uh, 
They will look like this. Tommy, for a picture of, of this uh, CDF. So, according to the previous discussion, according to this discussion, the the plot of this uh, CDF should look like this, right? So it's uh, the for one, it's always zero, and then at one, it will have a jump. Why it will have a jump? Because the one is the smallest value that's discrete when a variable contained. So at one, it will have a jump. What is the jump size? The size of the jump is just the probability that this random variable takes one, which is 5%. So it begins from zero until the smallest value it will take. It will have a jump. The jump size is the probability that it takes that value. And then you see that it will keep the keep a constant at the next level from one to two. Because two is the next possible value it can take. The probability that it takes two is ten percent. So at two, so it will have a jump. The jump size is ten percent. Then again, it will keep constant until the next possible value, which is four. The probability that it takes four is thirty-five percent. Then you see that it's a, the CDF will just look like this. From zero, keep constant until the first possible value. Make a jump. Jump size is the probability it takes that value. Keep on doing this until it reaches the largest possible value, which is 16. At 16, the probability would be from 1. It would make the last jump with probability 10%. After that, it would be equal to 1. Because the CDF is a probability, it cannot go beyond 1, right? And it is also the largest possible value it can take. So it would look like this, piecewise constant function, right? I think it's uh, from this uh, picture, you see it's a pretty clear that this PMF and CDF will be equivalent, at least for the discrete random variables, right? How to construct one from the other will be straightforward. If you know the PMF, you just uh, do something like this. At points, you just uh, you just uh, you just uh, specify those different values the random variables may take from the smallest one to the largest one, and the smallest one it makes the first jump. The next, and the at each value it will make a jump. The jump size is just the PMF, right? Until you it has the largest one, then from PMF you construct the CDF. So the question is, uh, if I gave you a uh, the CDF can recover the PMF. They will be even simpler, right? You just uh, need to find out where the jumps are, right? So you check those jumps. You know that this PMF or this discrete random variable may take values there at those jumps. What is the probability that it takes a specific value? You just check the jump size. That's the probability. It takes that value, right? So it is the it is the uh, this uh, this example. Questions?
just about all it looks like that. I think that, that's all I prepare for today. I don't think I can finish expected value today. So I will leave it uh, next week. <laughs>